Okay, let's get started. Um, a bit of announcements. I believe you should have got the grades for exercise one this morning. Um, and there will be a recap today after the lecture by Arnas. Okay, so last time we had a bit of um, introduction to exp explainability and um, kind of the starting materials basically. Uh, so what are the definitions of explainability and what kind of criteria we should be aware of and should try to optimize the um, explanation for. And uh, this time I'm gonna focus on feature attribution. Um, and I promised we are gonna follow this path of um, kind of identifying the problem and then uh, coming up with some, um, some methodologies to, uh, or coming up with some module or quantifiable ways to address the problem, and then um, thinking about more specific uh, methods. Okay, so that's what, what, what I'm gonna do um, today with the feature attribution. Um, but before that, I wish to also kind of give you a um, kind of overview of what I mean by feature attribution in general. So um, this is a typical kind of setting where you get feature attrib attribution. This is called uh, um, class activation map. CAM, um, and eventually what you're interested in is uh, some kind of heat map or um, some kind of ranking of pixels, uh, which is giving you information about which part of the image is containing important information for, uh, for the prediction for the model. So given an input image, you're gonna have a model, and the model will give you some kind of score map, right, and then, um, yeah, typically, uh, if you look at image classifiers using convolutional neural networks, they typically have um, a global average pooling to kind of make the final prediction uh, for the entire image. Um, but for CAM, they're actually taking the score from the score map, and then um, they can optionally do some kind of thresholding to um, kind of give some information about where the foreground object is for telling, yeah, the class of this image is cat. Uh, for those kind of details, we are gonna go into a lot more detail next time actually for CAM. Uh, but what's important here is to identify two important outputs from the network. So one is, uh, what is it, the prediction that we are mostly focused on. Um, but the other factor is, um, why do you think uh, the prediction is a cat? So in this case, it's in the form of um, some kind of heat map over um, the input image. Um, so heat map is a good example of um, kind of assigning importance to different so-called features of, a, of an input. Uh, but you know, like, there are many other ways than assigning um, importance or contribution to. Um, so you can take a look at single pixel at a time um, but at the same time, you can also um, try to look at patch-wise importance, right? You can kind of slide uh, the window through the image and see which patch is giving the most information for the prediction. Or you can take a look at super pixel uh, or instance mask. We all know what super pixel is. Uh, it's kind of a bottom-up way of um, grouping pixels together into kind of patches. Uh, so unlike image patch, it's more kind of delineating the boundaries of objects and kind of proposing what chunks of pixels could comprise an, uh, an object. So these are, there are many tons of methods for deriving super pixels from an image. Um, instance mask is more kind of high level in the sense that you wish to kind of delineate the semantics of an image like um, which pixels belong to a semantic class of an image, okay? Um, so for that, you typically need more kind of supervision uh, from humans using ground truth instance mask to train a model to predict uh, instance segmentation. Um, but that's one possibility for us to use, right, to generate explanation. Um, you can even go further away from the input pixels, input image and try to reason over more high-level concepts. So let's say it turns out that uh, this cat image contains um, several factors. One of them is cubes, 
The other one is furry, yellow eyes. So you see like some of the features are more global. You, you cannot actually um, pick out a region in the image where cute belongs to, right? It's hard to kind of do that. Uh, furry is also kind of a texture rather than kind of specific part of the image. Yellow eyes, maybe you can um, point to certain parts. So the point here is that um, there are tons of different ways of assigning uh, features. You can do it pixel-wise or you can do it uh, in a more high-level concept-wise. And based on that, you can try to answer the question of uh, why is this a cat, right? Um, the story is similar but slightly different for language models, again, right? Because um, language models are taking token sequences as inputs, so you turn the language into a sequence of tokens and then based on that you'd make the prediction. Um, so if you try to attribute to um, yeah, the input uh, for a language model, you can go back to the token space and say which part of the token in the sequence is making the prediction in this way, okay? So now, um, last time we said, yeah, counterfactual explanation is uh, super important for human-like explanations. So how do we do counterfactual explanation with image classifiers, let's say? Um, the kind of counterfactual question we can ask here is, uh, what happens if you remove certain feature? Okay, um, is it still going to be predicted as a cat or something else, right? So one possibility is to uh, block this ear region, one of the ears of the cat, and ask, uh, yeah, is this still a cat or not? Or you can also compute the score in this case and um, subtract uh, the, the original score from the current score. Um, but here the caveat is uh, we don't have a good, very good definition of what we mean by missing. Uh, so that's actually gonna be one of the core topics of the day, actually, um, how to define missing features. Um, do you mean black pixels or gray pixels or some pink pixels, right? So there are tons of possibilities here. It's kind of hard to say what is the right answer here. People love to use uh, uh, gray pixels here or black pixels or white pixels. Um, but they all come with some caveats, right? So, okay. The other possibility is to kind of um, replace the patch with another picture as well, right? Why can't you do that, right? So that's another type of counterfactual reasoning. Uh, counterfactual reasoning means uh, what happens if you change the image in a certain way, right? So. That's still a valid question. Um, the other type of counterfactual question we can ask is um, more global changes, right? We mentioned like uh, more, right, how to say, um, more attribute-based um, features like cuteness or furriness, right? But in this case, we can also take a look at the different degrees of corruption in the image. Um, so ImageNet C, for example, is built in a way that um, you can actually measure the drop in performance of a model when you make um, some artificial corruptions on the image, like um, adding Gaussian noise or adding some kind of um, weather conditions or motion blur, for example, right? So these are another uh, type of um, counterfactual explanation, right? What happens if you corrupt an image? Um, but for that, uh, typically what people do is to kind of look at the overall um, test score, right? They build a benchmark like that and measure the performance of a model um, under this benchmark compared to when you are measuring the performance on the original images. And you're gonna answer a more global question of um, uh, what's happening for the model as a whole for the entire test set uh, if you alter the images in a certain way. But the focus of explanation is more on the specific test case. I'm very curious about this test case, so, um, and I'm gonna change certain features in this test case. Uh, how's my prediction going to be different? 
So it's related with uh, these kind of benchmarks, but still the focus is a little different. Um, okay, so um, we're dealing with this kind of question of um, what to do with the counterfactual questions. Um, we can just alter some part of the image and compare the, the score. That's it, right? That's how you do uh, counterfactual reasoning over images or any input type. Uh, but in practice, you need a, um, ideally you wanna have a sequence of, or a set of counterfactual questions to answer some meaningful questions. Uh, so for example, you're interested in the, question, the answer to a question like, um, uh, like what, what feature in the image brings the greatest change in the output, right? Or can you rank the features in a way that um, uh, the topmost features are contributing to the most, uh, to the prediction, and uh, the last features are contributing the least to the prediction, okay? So for that kind of concept, you need a set of counterfactual reasoning. So you have to erase one feature at a time, for example, and then try to see um, when you remove each feature, what is the change in the output? and then compare the, uh, the change in outputs across all features. And that's gonna give you a set of score changes, and that's gonna rank your features for the current input according to their so-called contribution to final prediction. Um, that is important because uh, that's kind of intuitive explanation of, um, of the why question for this sample, which is, yeah, uh, which is made of, um, multiple features rather than um, a single feature. So we wanna find out uh, what is the most contributing factor here. Um, the most silly way to do this is to do the counterfactual reasoning in a brute force for all the features available. Um, but you know, like, if you consider ImageNet classifier, they take inputs of, um, how many is that? Um, 50,000, no, um, 150,000 pixels uh, per image, including all the RGB channels. So if you're doing um, such an explanation for, right, for, uh, for image classifier as large as image, image net classifiers, you have to do the um, counterfactual reasoning uh, 150,000 times. Well, times two, because you have to, well, depending on how many changes per pixel you want to introduce. Um, you also take a multiple of that. Um, so that's very expensive. So we have to think about how to do it more uh, quickly, more efficiently. Um, so at this point, I wish to kind of introduce uh, three layers of XAI research, I would say. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say uh, this has been something that's discussed a lot in uh, XAI research um, because for, for the layer one to two, uh, people kind of take it as granted and they just focus on the layer from two to three in many cases. Um, but I wanna be uh, kind of uh, lay out every layers here in a transparent way and um, try to think ground up whether each layer makes sense or not. Um, so let's say uh, the first layer is uh, real world problems. We start with some, um, some actual problems. Uh, why is my model not working for this particular test sample, for example? Or I need to kind of persuade my customers, right? I'm gonna provide this model to my customers. I need to somehow convince them it's working as expected. The numbers are not sufficient here because they also wish to know um, it's behaving in a like, human-like way, right? Whatever that means, right? They, they wish to kind of have some more trust in the, in the system. Um, and given those kind of requests, we can come up with some um, uh, well-defined task where we can actually measure the performance, right? Um, so that's the second stage. Uh, for example, we can try to determine the change in the model output when certain features are altered, changed. Or we are interested in the task of identifying the 
the features that are contributing to the most to the, to the prediction. Okay, uh, we we turn problem one into problem two because uh, problem one is more like very um, application specific and sometimes very vague, right? And um, it's kind of hard to define task and um, track progress. And so people try to identify a common feature that's needed for a lot of different use cases in layer one and come up with a, um, a set of problems for layer two, um, which is more research friendly, I would say. And if you define such a task here, um, typically it's conceptually easy to get the answer. For example, you can do the sliding window or kind of look at each single pixel at a time and try to see uh, the, the function changes when you alter each pixel at a time. Um, but of course, that's super expensive. And so there is layer three, which is focused on approximating um, this goal into something that's more computationally friendly and cheaper to compute. Um, so problem one to two is uh, often taken as granted, as I said, uh, from the research perspective. Of course, uh, practitioners care a lot about this, um, but researchers kind of say, yeah, of course you wanna um, take a look at the um, contribution of each pixel, why not, right? That's gonna be useful for practical um, applications. Uh, but the point here is that uh, perhaps that's not the case and we need to go back to practitioners and check if they really like this feature or not, right? Um, so end-to-end -end evaluation is actually taking this into account. So um, that's the value of end-to-end -end evaluation that we mentioned last time. Um, but yeah, my point is that this perhaps needs to be challenged and actually at the, at the um, our group, state group, uh, we do work on this problem of um, going back to practitioners and checking whether they like the solution or not, or like the approach that uh, the community, the XAI community is taking as a whole. Um, now for um, the second stage to third stage, um, that's, I would say, the main focus of XAI research. Um, and here, actually, the soundness um, evaluation arises quite naturally. Um, because what you can do here is you compute the ground truth in an expensive way and then compare the, um, the XAI method against the ground truth, okay? So here the, the question is um, the trade-off between how well you're matching the actual ground truth versus um, how much time you're spending on this or how, how many research, how much resources you you require. Um, so given all that, I'm gonna talk about the soundness evaluation for feature attribution. Um, so first of all, let's say the task is to measure the change of model outputs when certain features are erased, okay? Um, where erasing a feature will be defined more precisely later um, in today's lecture. And then we compute the ground truth by actually erasing each feature and seeing what kind of changes the model has. Um, and the focus of your method, feature attribution method, is to do this more efficiently. And evaluation focuses on soundness and efficiency. So by doing this, we are covering um, three out of six criteria that we discussed last time. So one is counterfactual, yes, we are answering counterfactual question. Um, soundness, yes, we are comparing against the ground truth change in the model output in a more cheap way, and so we are also looking at efficiency. Uh, so here the question is, uh, what about the other criteria? Um, selectiveness. Selectiveness uh, means um, you, you don't wanna take every feature, right? Uh, one could, yeah, depending on the method, it's sometimes, uh, it's often very easy to control the sparsity of the citation of supporting features. For example, if you have the, the ranking of pixels, then you can just take the top 10 pixels, right? And then that automatically um, gives you a very selective explanation, right? So in general, there is a good solution for selectiveness, so we, we don't actually focus too much on that. 
for, for this practical reason. Um, social and interactive, I think uh, this criterion is kind of independent of um, the focus now, right? You can always try to come up with the module which is explaining in a more human-friendly way the, the pixel-wise contribution to humans. Um, and to end useful, we're gonna talk about it, uh, more about that later. Um, yeah, but here, the question is uh, whether um, the task at hand is eventually gonna be useful for uh, practical applications. Okay, so let's jump into the evaluation of feature attribution methods. I'm first gonna talk about how not to do it, um, how people do it, and how that's not a good idea. So one example is qualitative e evaluation. A lot of people used to do it um, some time ago. So let's say there's an original image and there's a top label and score. I hope that's visible, but yeah. The top label uh, for the first image is reflex camera and the score is 0 0.9937 or so, right? Um, and on the right side, you see the explanation, like pixel-wise explanation of why the model predicts um, the image as a camera, okay? And given this kind of image, the paper says, well, yeah, I didn't explain the last two columns, but these are like two different explanation methods, okay? Um, so the first column is called integrated gradients, uh, which is the method proposed by the paper. And the last column is the gradients, which is the baseline they compare against. So they're, they need to make a claim here that their integrated gradient is working better than gradients, okay? So yeah, back to the excerpt from the paper, um, they say, yeah, notice that integrated gradients are better than input gradients at reflecting distinctive features of the input image, okay? So that sounds a rise, right? Because, um, you know, like if you look at the, um, the features selected by integrated gradients, you do see uh, more camera pixels compared to um, the, the, the rightmost column, right? Seems to make sense, but uh, we're gonna um, think about whether that really makes sense or not. Um, second example. Um, so that's a machine tra translation system. So on the rows, you see French words. Um, and on the uh, columns, you see German words. So I guess the translation was from French to German or the other way around. And the color there indicates uh, how much of that particular column was used for generating the row, okay? So it seems all right, right? Because, um, because roughly the meaning of the words match across uh, uh, for the highest scoring um, cells between the rows and columns. Um, and the paper says we observe that results make intuitive sense. For example, und is uh, mostly attributed to and, and morgen is mostly attributed to morning. Ah, that's not French actually, that's English. But here the question is, uh, what if the model was not doing that, right? Um, isn't it uh, confirmation bias? So let's talk about this more later. But I wish to give you a bunch, a bunch of examples first, what people used to be doing. Um, and here you see a, a bunch of um, hit maps for the same image. So with the French horn, you're gonna see uh, like hit maps generated from different explanation methods. So you have GAP, different variants of GAP for different um, networks. Um, and then you also have backpropagation for the last two columns. And now the paper says, I think the paper is trying to say GAP is working better than the others, right? And the paper says we observe that our CAM, CAM is basically the very close to, related to GAP. Um, CAM approach significantly outperforms the backpropagation approach, the last two columns, okay, based on this picture. Yeah. 
Another example uh, from the same paper, it says, we observed that our CAM approach significantly outperforms the backpropagation approach of 23. The same, yeah. By saying that, yeah, if you look at the hidden maps, they actually correspond to um, the ground truth location of the object, okay? And they also come up with some quantitative measure as well by comparing the heat maps against the uh, uh, ground truth boxes. So here they are measuring um, the number of times where the overlap between the predicted region and the ground truth box is greater than certain IOU threshold, intersection over union threshold. And, uh, and say that, look, um, GAP is achieving a better, well, lowest error in terms of localization um, compared to the baselines. So the, the question is, does that really mean um, a method is working better than the other method in terms of explanation? So here, um, I'm showing all these examples to make a point here that uh, all of these evaluations are flawed um, in the sense that a good explanation does not mean um, it aligns well with human intuition. Because uh, models are not very well aligned with humans. And that's the reason why we need explanation in the first place. So if you are trying to um, say, yeah, the, the explanation is working well because that kind of confirms my expectation, then you're uh, making a big mistake here because um, maybe the model was doing something else than what you expected, um, but your explanation method is not living up to your standard and, um, right? and making a prediction which is um, confirming your expectation, right? Then there, there is a double failure here, but somehow double failure leads to kind of good results. Um, so, when, so in other words, when explanation is misaligned, there are actually two possibilities. First, um, the explanation method was wrong, right? Uh, while the model was actually doing um, something that is very well aligned with humans, right? And so in that case, you should penalize the um, explanation method. But the second possibility is uh, the explanation method is actually correctly um, exposing the misalignment. And the model was, in the first place, misaligned. In that case, you do not penalize the explanation method, but you should penalize the model for being kind of different from what humans would do. Well, depending on the um, end goal, right? If your end goal is to make the model behave like humans, then yes, you should penalize the model um, in this case, but yeah. The point is that uh, this kind of evaluation is not really telling you um, the quality of um, explanation. Um, so the typical pitfall of uh, soundness evaluation is that um, your evaluation may not actually depend on the function itself, the model F itself. Um, so here the question is whether the heat map represents the true causes of predicting f of x, right? And a good explanation should depend on all three factors here, x, y, and f. And if you look at um, the evaluation from the qualitative um, perspective, um, the evaluation is not dependent on f at all. Um, it doesn't care about what the model might have been doing internally at all, but if you, you just care about, yeah, given an x and given a y, that heat map sounds like a good explanation, okay? So if something like that happens, that's a good sign that your explanation is not, your evaluation is not doing the right thing. Uh, likewise for um, quantitative evaluation using ground truth localization. Um, we know from uh, years of experience with computer vision that models do not look at foreground region for making the prediction. 
they sometimes look even more at the background region for making the prediction. So if your explanation says the model is looking at background region, you should not penalize the explanation actually. And so any any evaluation based on ground truth localization is kind of wrong for um, explanation. So let's talk about uh, then what is the right way to do that. So one, um, yeah, as I said, sound, soundness evaluation is all about approximating the ground truth objective, um, ground truth quantity of um, what happens to the prediction if you remove um, certain feature, okay? Um, actually, one way to do this in an expensive way is to come up with some ground truth, um, how to say, ground truth heat map by removing each feature at a time, right? And then um, you're gonna end up with some heat map that's gonna um, give you a ranking of which features are the most important and which features are not. And compare this heat map with the generated, this approximate heat map that you're trying to evaluate. Um, but this is actually a cheaper way to do that, um, which is more kind of dynamic and more lazy way of evaluating, uh, which is basically, you first get a heat map from your method, and then um, based on this generated heat map, you're gonna get a ranking of pixels according to your method. And uh, what you do then is, based on this ranking, you're gonna remove each feature at a time from the original image. And then measure how much drop in um, classification prediction for the ground truth class, or the predicted class, uh, you're gonna have. Okay? Um, this is more lazy and more efficient way to evaluate than first computing everything and then comparing the two hit maps. Um, so yeah, what's, what's written down here is basically, uh, yeah, you're identifying the most important pixel um, dictated by your method and then you remove it and yeah, and see uh, how much that uh, decreases the correctness of the prediction. And eventually you're interested in the speed of decreasing the prediction as you remove the most important pixels. If your, if your explanation was right, then the speed of decrease will be very steep because you're actually removing the most important pixels. But if you're kind of picking some pixels at random, then the rate of decrease will be um, almost identical to random erasure of, of pixels. So that is a way to kind of quantifying this um, the citation of the right causes. Yes? Uh, because you see the same color yeah, in different pixels. Um, in practice, you have uh, kind of floating values here, so um, the chance of having the same value will be very low, but, um, but of course, you can introduce different ways to resolve um, clashes, like resolve the same rank pixels, like randomizing the choices. Or Yeah, yeah, but sometimes you also wish to have more granular um, changes because for the for drawing the plots, you might want to have more um, high resolution plot, basically. Um, in that case, you can also randomize the um, the choices. Um, yeah. Also, when you when you wish to compare multiple curves um, in this kind of evaluation, then sometimes you wish to kind of have um, have more aligned uh, kind of X ticks. Uh, so these are all very practical considerations, but conceptually what you said is also a viable solution as well. You can basically just skip those, uh, those chunk of pixels and um, yeah. Okay. Now um, remove and predict. 
Yeah, so for example, so I think you all understood what I mean by this, but this is kind of giving you um, a real example. So let's say the image looks like that on the left and then the explanation is like on the right. And what you do is you remove pixels according to the importance dictated by the explanation. Um, and here remove means you're replacing the pixel values with gray pixels. And uh, the, the plots on the right will be the kind of plots that you're gonna get as a result of this uh, procedure. So we always uh, compare against the random erasing baseline. And the metric is a relative measure of drop-in performance, of drop-in um, the first prediction of the model, okay? Uh, when you erase according to your explanation method. So compared to the random baseline, your uh, prediction should fall very quickly, and the quicker the better. Um, so here we show um, um, different results on different data sets, CUV, Open Images, and ImageNet. And uh, the horizontal dotted line, dashed line is, uh, dotted line actually, is the random baseline, which is constant at one in this case because uh, this is uh, exactly a random, so a uh, relative measure against the random baseline. Um, and on top of that, we see uh, some of the methods have steeper decrease in performance for the initial, I would say, 10% erasure of pixels. Um, so we see that the red curves tend to have a very steep decrease in performance compared to random baseline, uh, while some of the others do not. Some of them actually increase beyond um, the random baseline, meaning that uh, it's, it's actually picking up something that is perhaps um, even less meaningful than random pixels, or introducing some artifact of erasure, which I'm gonna talk about next. Yes? Yes, um, because at that point, uh, the random baseline is also seeing the same kind of image where you erase all the pixels. And eventually they should match at the endpoints. Okay, so this is kind of funny. Um, it's kind of funny that sometimes the curve goes up beyond the random baseline, uh, like in open images here. Um, but it is what it is. and. Um, I strongly believe this is a kind of evidence that the way you erase a pixel in an image is uh, very important. So I'm gonna talk about that from now. Um, so the conventional way to erase pixels or erase feature is by replacing the feature with zero. Um, Black, Black pixels, pixels or gray pixels. pixels. And there's something called missing misplies from this domain, from the um, XAI uh, community. So let's say the original image is like that, and you're erasing some pixels according to the importance, right? Um, well, in the, in the second case, you're erasing at random. Um, in the third case, you're erasing um, the least salient part. So you're starting from the border of the image. You can also start from the most salient part by starting from the center of the image. Okay, but if you look at um, the prediction of the network, uh, in the first case you have flat warm, but um, in the erase cases you have predictions like crossword or um, Jigsaw puzzle or clip dwelling. You know, like if you look at these kind of classes, um, they give a strong hint that the black pixels introduced here um, actually adds some additional information rather than monotonically decreasing information. Um, the color and the shape of the erased pixels actually. Uh, 
gives a strong indication for objects like crossword, jigsaw puzzle, cliff dwelling, and so on. So information is, uh, erasing information is kind of hard in general. So the question is what is the right way to remove information then uh, for this kind of image domain? So given this kind of image, um, the original image is uh, predicted as wool in a correct way. But now um, I'm curious about the contribution from those uh, black pixels. And I, I wish to kind of, um, yeah, I erase these pixels and see uh, what is the prediction. And it turns out um, the predictions change a little bit. Like instead of um, confident wool, now it's a little less confident and instead other classes are predicted um, instead, like person class or cushion class. Yeah, interesting. But the question is, uh, does it really faithfully represent the removal of information in black pixels? So one um, possibility here is to introduce in-painting, imputation, data imputation. Um, instead of leaving those pixels as black, you can uh, use some available um, in-painting functions to in painting model to fill in those pixels um, to kind of merge with the rest of the scene or blend naturally into the scene. Okay. So now um, what you're doing is you're minimizing the artifact from the black pixels while you're only reutilizing the available information from the surrounding context. So the information content is not, there's no information content um, added here, but you're trying to minimize the artifact from the black, using black, okay? Um, but one caveat, of course, is that in painting comes with its own artifacts, right? So, um, but there have been people who try to kind of develop this idea into, um, um, into some measurement of actual contribution of each feature in the image, okay? So they didn't stop at just in-painting the pixels for the um, missing values, but they did it uh, multiple times using some probabilistic in-painting function and then marginalizing out the final prediction. So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, from probabilistic point of view, uh, the right, estimation of the, the missing feature is by marginalizing that feature out, arguably, I would say. So the way to do it is um, you define the probabilistic quantity of predicting class C given X, which is the input image, except for the feature I, I feature, okay? And that is defined by the total probability um, over the conditionals times the um, probability of each condition, uh, which is basically the, the prediction of C given um, the removed pixels, sorry, the original pixel minus the removed pixels plus the um, so in painting, which is given by Xi, right? And Xi is, uh, Xi is following the probability of the condition conditioning upon the rest of the pixels, which are not erased, okay? And uh, the practical way to um, estimate this probability is by using a Monte Carlo estimation, where you're sampling from the in-painting model Q, right? So this is basically um, approximating the conditional um, distribution of feature I given the rest of features and you're averaging the uh, class prediction given um, these different types of in paintings. So the difference from the previous solution that I came up with is uh, that you're averaging over, uh, averaging the prediction over multiple um, in painting options. What you do afterwards is uh, fairly simple. You just take the difference between this estimated prediction without i feature information and the original uh, prediction. You can do it after taking log as well, depending on your preference. 
Okay. And the result looks like that. So in this case, they, uh, they made a sliding window going across every location in the, um, in the input pixels. And for every sliding window, they inpainted um, the, the window and compared the difference between the inpainted prediction and the original prediction. And red means uh, um, the region is contributing heavily to the prediction. Blue means it is not. Yeah, so yeah, this is the result. You know, this is only qualitative again, so I don't have much comments here. Maybe that's the truth of what the models say. Um, so they made a, a qualitative comparison again um, against the imp gradient again. Um, and they say, yeah, it's, it looks better. I think they said that again. Uh, but I'm not going to say that because I know that's a wrong judgment, right? Um, so I think here the, the actual pro for this method is that um, it's conceptually precise counterfactual. So I wouldn't even say this is a method. This is like a definition of um, explanation. The only question is whether that definition is really useful in practice or not. Well, there's another question which is uh, whether the in painting module is doing the right job. Given that the in painting is do, doing the right job and um, this is useful in practice, I think this is a valid way to measure um, contribution. Except that, yeah, also this is very expensive as well because you have to um, do the in painting module for in painting for like every different location of the image. You know, like if you're using a, like state of the arts in painting based on diffusion models, um, this is, this is going to be uh, computationally prohibitive. So for sure, um, the field will benefit a lot from the approximate solution here. Um, another way to um, simulate missing feature is by using um, blurring. Um, of course, that comes with um, another type of artifact, uh, but still I wish to introduce this as a, another possibility here. Yeah, so um, to find out what is the contributing factor for the flute prediction here, um, one could learn, um, one could try to um, create a mask here where according to the mask you're erasing using blurring. Um, okay, I'm going to explain what, what I mean by that in more detail uh, with this equation. So here, um, given a model and given an image to analyze, what we are trying to do is to learn a mask, right, which is telling you uh, what has been the most important um, set of pixels contributing to the prediction. Uh, so this is a minimization task where you have um, M, which is binary mask to be optimized. And um, this lambda one minus M is kind of controlling um, the area of erased area. Okay, so when this is large, you're gonna get penalized, right? Meaning that when M is small, it's gonna get penalized. Um, well, the mask is small, then it's gonna get penalized. So this means uh, M is, the visible area, and one minus m is the invisible area, okay? And uh, you also try to minimize the, um, the prediction for class C from the network, um, given the visibility mask here. So you're trying to kind of minimize the area of the mask in such a way that your prediction for class C is minimal. So you are, you're really asked to, um, pick a pixel which is contributing most heavily to the prediction, okay? And here, um, this large phi of x nodes and m, this is indicating the blurring of image x according to the mask m. So um, that's a more complex function than just erasing uh, pixels on mask m. 
by replacing black pixels. But according to this mask, you introduce actual blurring of the image. Um, and this function is uh, differentiable. So um, you can try to, so you can, um, you can easily use a gradient descent to solve this optimization problem. But I'm not gonna go into uh, a lot of details here. I'm just saying um, it is a possibility. So yeah, as you see, uh, instead of just painting um, black pixels, you can do uh, blurring. So back to ant and usefulness. Um, so there can be a lot of different end goals, right? You know, many of them like model debugging uh, or understanding as the end goal or enhancing human confidence. So I'm gonna talk about how we can um, set one of these as end goal and um, build some evaluation framework, okay? So um, the current evaluation is way too much focused on soundness. If you look at papers, I would say nine out of 10 will be focused on um, the soundness itself, uh, but without the consideration of whether that's actually gonna be useful for um, the end goal or the um, end users. Um, but if you think about it, there, there are many um, possible users of the system, like machine learning engineer who cares about debugging, uh, or scientists who wish to understand the, the internal mechanism itself, or let's say a doctor or so uh, who, who, who values trust a, a lot more than the others. Um, the focus of soundness just stops at the generation of the explanation. Um, but uh, with the end goal in mind, we now care about the end users, okay? And for this kind of evaluation, we necessarily have to um, have human in the loop, okay? Uh, which means uh, we have to actually bring in humans uh, for evaluation. I actually don't see any other way to do that than having actual humans there and asking them if they benefit from this procedure or not. Um, so here we have one paper. Uh, what I cannot predict, I do not understand. The human-centered evaluation framework for explainability methods. Uh, so this paper also did a very nice experiment with humans. Um, so their goal was to say, um, if you look at if you present those explanations to humans, they actually help humans understand the internal behavior of the model. Like, and the way to um, say that is actually happening is by making humans predict the model prediction by looking at the um, explanation. Okay, so um, here we have three tasks. One is to tell the difference tell whether a given image contains a wolf or ASCII. Second task is um, identifying new, uh, classifying leaves. And third is ImageNet. And there uh, we have three different tasks. One, discovering bias, whether you're looking too much at the foreground or background for, uh, for telling it's uh, wolf or husky, um, or whether, um, because leaf classification is kind of hard uh, if you're not a, an expert. And so by looking at the explanations, you try to see whether humans learn new strategies to um, tell which species of tree or leaf is this. And the third is um, understanding some failure cases. So when the model makes a mistake, you try to see, um, understand why the model made a mistake. And if you understand this, then perhaps you should be able to predict whether the model is going to make a mistake or not by looking at the predict, um, explanation. Okay, so um, the evaluation framework is like this. Um, you have meta predictor, which is a human. Um, and you have a learning phase where you have um, triplets, image, explanation and the prediction of the model, okay? And um, you have evaluation phase. 
So during the learning phase, what's happening is um, the meta predictor or human sits in front of a computer and looks at a bunch of triplets, image, um, explanation, and prediction. And from that, um, the human should learn what kind of prediction the model generally makes when the image looks like that and the um, explanation looks like that. So for example, um, you can see whether um, the model is focusing on the background. And if you look at the image and the background is like snowy, then um, the prediction of the model will be husky, for example, rather than all. Okay? And this is the way you identify what kind of bias the model is relying on. And if you're doing it successfully, and if the, um, if the uh, explanation is faithful enough, then eventually at test time, given a new image and new explanation for the model of interest, you're gonna generate a good prediction of the model prediction. So that's the evaluation phase. Um, and of course, it's important to compare against the baseline. So as a baseline, you have another set of humans, a different set of humans, um, who are just looking at um, the input images and the model prediction uh, over time, right? So they are also trained on the image and model prediction pairs. And at test time, they, they only take a look at the image part and try to predict what the model will predict on this image without looking at any explanation. So this way, you are controlling the effect of explanation or making humans understand the machine model. And by doing this, um, First of all, we notice uh, there's a control here, uh, which is showing um, yeah, the, the case. Okay, so there are kind of double baseline here. So one baseline is uh, kind of uh, already included here in the utility K metric, right? So you're always comparing against the set of people who did not look at any explanation. But of course, the explanation itself may not depend on the model itself as well, right? We talked about that before. Um, when the explanation is not kind of independent of the model, then um, the explanation is not explaining the model, right? So as another baseline, they came up with a um, ground-up explanation or ground-up saliency, bottom-up saliency, which is uh, kind of predicting the most likely salient region in the image uh, without any dependence on the function or class or whatsoever, okay? So that second baseline is given here by, um, by dashed line here, uh, indicate, indicated by control. And if you look at, uh, for example, GradCam here, GradCam tends to give good information about um, um, the true biases the model has. And therefore, based on that, humans are able to predict the, uh, the model prediction pretty well. Um, something like 40% more likely than humans who did not look at GradCam scores. Uh, for uh, identifying new strategies case, right, using leaf classification. They also seem to learn the ways um, which model is making prediction better, um, about 10% to 20% better, depending on which strategy you're taking. Um, and of course, if you increase the number of examples that you present to humans, um, you generally have better um, human performance on model prediction prediction. Another important uh, factor outcome here is that um, there's no good correlation between um, faithfulness metrics and end-to-end -end human usefulness metric, okay? So even if the, the method is super faithful, that does not fully explain whether that's gonna be useful for end users. So there's no way we can actually replace um, 
this kind of human in the loop evaluation with faithfulness metric alone. And if you actually care about the end, end goal, you probably have to set up a study like this to see whether um, explanation is serving the application. So that was it for explanation evaluation, feature attribution evaluation. And let's take a look at methods for making this more efficient. Um, again, uh, brute force is kind of expensive. Um, so we can uh, make a lot of assumptions and make it simpler. Um, so one special case we can think about is um, the feature is a pix single pixel now, and uh, we're going to make a very small perturbation on this pixel. Okay. Um, so let's say the original pixel value for that tiny pixel there was 232, 216, and 231. Um, but you're going to make a small, like one uh, value change in the R ch red channel. And let's say, uh, based on that, your new prediction of the um, class here for cat is 0.1% uh, lower. Okay. Who cares about that, right? But um, somehow, this is what gradient, gradient is measuring, right? Input gradient. Um, but of course, there's a lot of um, smart techniques included here, namely calculus, right? Um, so of course, some ways to uh, measure these infinitesimal changes, um, the outcome of these infinitesimal changes so many times Right, but um, smart way is to just use backpropagation to uh, to turn this numerical, uh, you know, numerical um, approximation into a linear computation. Yeah. So conceptually, it looks like this. So, um, given an input domain and input sample of interest, we're making a tiny change towards uh, the direction i where i is the index of the pixel, um, by a tiny um, change delta, and you wish to see the change between um, f of x plus delta ei and f of x, okay? That's exactly what gradient is, uh, gradients, partial gradients, with respect to x and i um, indicates, right? In other words, this is like a linearization of the end-to-end -end function, which is fully differentiable um, around the test point of interest. You know, linear functions are very well understandable, so it benefits to linearize the function. Um, if, even if you can only linearize it around the tiny kind of ball around the test input of interest. So from practical point of view, um, taking the input gradient is not the end of the story because eventually we wish to kind of assign um, score per pixel. If you just take the, um, take the gradient, you're gonna get three times the, the number of pixels because of the RGB channels. Well, depending on um, which kind of, sometimes you have fourth channel as well for, um, for you know how transparent this is. Um, anyways, so you have to, First of all, um, take the maximum across the channels to kind of make this into a single hit map. Um, if you think about it, there are also positive values and negative values. Positive value means uh, if you change it in an infinitesimal amount, the, the score goes up um, and vice versa, right? Um, but either case, um, you can estimate kind of the importance of the pixel, right? So the important importance of the pixel does not have any uh, parity, it does not have any direction. So what we do is we take the absolute value. So zero means no importance, and whether it's positive, great positive number or great negative number, they mean um, they're affecting the final prediction a lot. Um, and also, if you wish to kind of generate a heat map, what you always have to do is to kind of um, put the heat map in the right range. 
between zero and one because you eventually have to kind of print this out as a as a hidden map, right? And that means you have to kind of assign colors to each value, and that means you have to kind of set the right range of yeah color values and uh, project your gradient values um, into this range. And one way to do that is to do max normalization. So whatever pixel is taking the max value in the image is uh, assigned to value one, and the lowest value, um, well, in this case, zero gradient is mapped to zero value um, in the final heat map, okay? And so there are some uh, uh, very boring but still very pretty cool steps after getting the input gradients to make this into a heat map. Um, but even with that, we still have a lot of issues with input gradients. You probably have realized that input gradients are super, super noisy and um, doesn't seem to help a lot, right? For you to understand what's going on inside the, uh, the model. So, um, I would say input gradients are, tend to be uh, very noisy, and they also are very unstable with respect to small changes throughout the image, okay? So let's say you shift, like, like an adversarial example, let's say you shift the whole image by one pixel to the left, and the kind of input gradient you're gonna get for this new image will be vastly different from the original case. So the question is how can we get something smoother? Um, so one possibility is to do something called smooth gradient. Uh, you can compute gradients in the vicinity of the input. Um, so you introduce this new variable epsilon, which is sampled from um, a small Gaussian around zero. And every time you compute the gradient, you compute the gradient from um, x plus epsilon, okay? And then um, you are averaging across all these uh, gradient values. And if you do that, you tend to get a much smoother gradient map. So conceptually, you're doing something like this. So you first perturb um, the input image across uh, different locations around x. So you're introducing small perturbations around x. Uh, but now you're introducing, um, yeah, for every point you shift it to the i direction, okay? That's where this delta ei comes in here. So the, the black dots are kind of perturbations of the original input, but based on these perturbations you're doing once again perturbation to a specific direction, feature i direction, okay, which are red points. And then eventually you are interested in the, the shift of function outputs between red points and black points, okay? In this way you are measuring the contribution of i feature in a more stable way than before. So in equations, you're interest, interested in the, in the quantity of f of x plus z plus delta ei minus f of x plus z, where z is the epsilon in the previous slide. Um, and that can be uh, approximated by the, um, by the gradient, right? Um, at x plus z, right? At x plus z. We are taking the direction of ei here. Um, yeah, basically this. Okay. Um, so we can try to ex extrapolate this to more changes beyond the vicinity of the point, right? Because when we are making small changes around the image, we are still kind of playing around in the vicinity of the image. Um, but is it meaningful to kind of go beyond the vicinity and make more global, make more great changes of the image and see um, uh, for all these great changes, do we see kind of um, 
the same kind of contribution of feature i. Yes, you can do it like this. Um, so let's say um, the original x is here, and we set some uh, completely different image, x prime, um, or black image in this case, let's say, and try to interpolate pixel-wise from the original image to this, it's called baseline image, uh, a baseline image. And along the way, you try to measure the contribution of feature i by taking the gradient. Okay. So for every interpolated point, you take the difference between the, the perturbed interpolated point and the interpolated point. And then you're summing over them. In equations, you can write this down like this. So you're um, sampling from the uniform and you're taking the interpolated points, okay? So you're basically sampling uniformly from this uh, line segment between x and x prime. And at that point, you're taking the perturbation towards the direction feature i minus the, uh, just the interpolated point. So this is red and this is black. This is red and this is black. Um, you, you can approximate this by, um, by the gradient, right? Because uh, delta is small. So you can take the gradient at f of x plus alpha x prime minus x um, towards the direction delta ei. Um, because expectation is linear, you can take this inside the inner product, and then you're gonna have um, expectation over the gradient. Um, and again, you can approximate the expectation with a, um, well, it's not an approximation, it's actually an exact uh, computation because the other way to write this down, um, this um, expectation is by um, doing the integration over the line segments. Okay, so we have this form here, and why do I do this computation, right? Because I want to make a point in the next slide um, that the form that we got here is uh, very close to something called integrated gradients. So this was all kind of preparation to kind of explain what integrated gradients is and the connections to smooth grass. So it's kind of related to smooth grad, but now you're kind of not just looking at the vicinity of the X, but you're looking at a line segment from, um, from one image to the other. And if you compute that, eventually you're gonna get um, some integral over the gradient along this line segment. Um, but depending on like which direction you're looking at, you will have to take the I elements of that uh, integrated gradient, okay? Um, but if you look at the original paper for integrated gradients, you actually have one more factor that's multiplied um, on top, which is the difference in pixel values at i-th location. Okay. So the question is, why do you do that? What kind of um, changes do, do they introduce by multiplying with this scalar factor? Um, they do that because they wish to derive a nice uh, um, characteristic. So, so that is the integrated gradient. So you take the i element of the um, integration of the gradient along the line segment, and then you multiply with this scalar. And let's maybe um, do a summation over all the features, okay? If you sum over all the features, um, so in other words, you put sum over i here, and then, um, you know, um, again, this is a linear function, so um, the summation and the multiplication with the scalar can actually go inside the in inner product, and it's gonna go here, and if you take the multiplication of xi prime and ei, you're gonna get xi, right? And Inside the inner product is the same thing as um, doing the inner product between um, the integration and um, the vector here, okay? And that's exactly, a, and you can also take the integral outside because it's also linear, right? 
So you're doing the, the um, dot product between yeah, this uh, gradient and this direction, this vector from x to x prime, um, and you are summing over this. Yeah, but still, why do you do that? Right, because I wish to uh, make use of this fundamental theorem of integrals on this line segment. So it says uh, when you take the integral over the inner product between um, the gradient over some line, um, parameterized line here, parameterized by t, and if you take the inner product between that and uh, the direction of the line segment, right? So r prime is basically the vector at time t pointing to the direction where the line segment is going, right? The tangent line. Um, so in other words, you're taking the gradient with respect to the direction the segment is going, right? And if you uh, take the, if you sum over all these um, directional derivatives along the line, then that's eventually the difference between the function value at the endpoints, right? So we understand a, a bit of similarity between this fundamental theorem of calculus and, uh, and this formulation here. So we can basically uh, plug in f instead of b here, and uh, the line segment is parameterized by x plus alpha x prime minus x. If you do that, then what you eventually get is uh, something like this, saying, yeah, if you take the, um, if you sum over all the features with your um, integrated gradients attribution, what you're gonna get is the difference between the um, function output or the baseline image and your test image of interest. Um, yeah, if you write it down, you have something like this. You, if you sum over i for every feature-wise integrated gradients, then you're gonna get um, the difference between the function prediction for the original image and the function prediction for the um, baseline image. And this is called completeness axiom for um, it's basically an axiom that they came up with in this uh, integrated gradients paper, uh, which is stating something that is kind of intuitively useful for attribution methods. Um, you basically want to make sure that your attributions have to sum up to the original prediction value, right? So, you know, like, all of these are feature-wise or pixel-wise attributions. And if you um, sum all these uh, contributions, then you end up having um, the original prediction. In other words, you are kind of trying to turn the original prediction into a summation, where summation is something that we understand super well, right? Um, here, the critical question is uh, how to set the baseline, right? And ideally, for this to be kind of meaningful, you have to set the baseline as an image without any information. That's why I said uh, something like a black image. But of course, the question is whether well, a black image uh, means no information at all, right? Because it still means black, right? Black means black. Um, so, yeah, I'm coming back to this uh, slide before where we are comparing the integrated gradients and uh, gradients at the gra normal gradients, right? So the paper argued that integrated gradients seems to give better um, attribution. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna talk about that, whether that's correct or not, because we talked about it already. But here we're gonna um, talk about whether the baseline of black image makes sense. Of course it doesn't make sense, right? Because, yeah, black means something. Um, but there's another problem, which is that, you know, like there, we are multiplying um, each feature, feature attribution with the pixel-wise difference, right? Um, this factor here. And if you set the baseline image as a black image, 
the, the X node as a black image. And any pixel in the given image um, that has black pixel will not be assigned any value, right? So in other words, if you have a black camera, then on the pixels, black pixels of the image, you're not gonna get any attribution, right? So that's kind of um, weird, that's kind of weird, because um, even if that black pixel was super important, you're not gonna assign any attribution to that. Uh, so I'm not saying there is a good solution for that, I'm just pointing out um, some of the uh, flaws in each method. There is no perfect explanation method. Um, and now I wish to talk a little bit about um, the cases where actually uh, missing is is well defined again. Okay, so, so the problem with missing is is coming from, I would say, two factors. Um, one factor is that you somehow have to kind of, you have a fixed size input, basically, like an image. And if you erase certain part of it, you cannot just erase it and give it to the model. You have to somehow fill these missing pixels with something. Um, the other problem is that uh, there's no pixel value that is assigned for indicating missingness. One could have assigned, let's say, uh, a pink value, because pink does not arise naturally too much in, um, in, natu in nature, um, and use that pink value as meaning for there's no meaning, there's no, um, yeah, <laughs> scary. <laughs> um, there's no information for that pixel, yeah? But actually in some other domains, some other types of inputs, it is still possible to indicate missingness. Uh, first case is, again, there is, when there is an input value that is assigned exactly for the absence of the feature. Um, and the second case is where um, the model is trained to interpret the pre-assigned value here as the absence of information. So one example is uh, one could use mask token M for missing tokens in transformers. Um, so this kind of mask token uh, arises quite naturally in the training of BERT, for example, uh, or um, autoregressive models when you try to block the tokens where, um, where there is no um, input. And you have to kind of block the, the corresponding um, slots in the self-attention. And also when the model can handle variable length inputs, um, yeah, uh, one could also indicate missing this by removing the tokens of interest, okay? So in other words, in language models, uh, there seems to be a better definition of missing this by just erasing it or replacing it with some special token. Um, so for those kind of domains, uh, I would say two additional methods make sense. One is line and the other one is Shapley values. Um, so line is a method for fitting a sparse linear model um, instead of a complex model. But here the caveat is that you can only fit this sparse model around the vicinity of specific test case of interest. Of course, you cannot have both of them, right? If you wish to explain the model for the whole region, then um, the model has to kind of stay complex. But if you're only explaining the model in the vicinity of the input, then you, you have more freedom in terms of the complexity of the model. And so for that uh, particular case X here in this case, you're trying to feed a surrogate model G that is kind of closely mimicking what F is doing around the vicinity. And uh, this pi X is kind of the measure of distance from X, so you're trying to make sure that G is following F in the vicinity of X. And um, this uh, omega here is the measure of complexity, so you wish to make the linear model sparse. Um, if you go into details of the formulation here, you have something like this. Um, so you're trying to solve the arg mean, the minimization problem with two terms. One term is fidelity term and the other one is um, sparsity regularization. For the fidelity, 
um, G is defined as, as a linear function. So uh, let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about the, the class of functions G first, right? So we want the sparse linear model. And the way we can enforce that is by defining G to be a linear function of the input Z, where Z is kind of in the same space as X, right? And omega G is uh, the regularization of counting how many weights are um, there, so non-zero. So you're basically counting the number of weights that are uh, non-zero, and if it's larger than K, then you're penalizing by infinity. So yeah, it's not a regularization, it's, it's more like a constraint for the optimization problem. Um, and now you are using a um, fidelity term here that looks like an else loss. So if your function output is like a, uh, in, sorry, um, the real value, right? Then you can take the L2 distance between the function outputs between F and Z, sorry, F and G. And uh, you can weight the loss according to the closeness to the input X of interest, right? So we are sampling around X which is Z here, Z is like a sample around X. And um, yeah, for those points, we make sure that F and G are kind of similar to each other, okay? This pi X is kind of dic um, dictating how, uh, how much weight you wanna give to samples that are close to X, right? So if it's close, then you're gonna assign more weight. If it's far away, then you're gonna assign close to zero. So it looks like that. So given um, a function f and the decision boundary for function f is like this, and this x is your input of interest, test case of interest, and you wanna understand why um, the prediction of x is red here. And the way you do it is by fitting a linear function in the vicinity of x, that's kind of closely following the behavior of F. So G is, uh, so the decision boundary for G is like this. It's kind of closely following the tangent line of the decision boundary for F, right? Um, of course, G is not explaining the behavior of F for all the inputs, possible inputs, but still in the vicinity of X, um, the prediction is kind of consistent between F and G. It is kind of close to what uh, input gradient is doing, but it's different in the sense that you're pushing for something that's sparse linear. You're adding more sparsity condition here. And because you have sparsity condition, um, you need to have a good definition of what it means to turn off a feature, right? Because weight zero means you're basically turning off the feature for that, for the corresponding feature index, right? Um, and that's why I didn't really talk about line for images because for images there's no good definition of what is a missing feature as we have seen. Uh, but for language, we have fairly good understanding of what missingness is. And so we can have something like this. So um, this is like a YouTube comment and um, uh, you have a spam classification task here. Uh, I've taken an example from this uh, tutorial here. Um, so class zero means no spam and class one means it's spam. And uh, we try to understand why the model predicts spam for this sample for Christmas song, Visit My Channel. And uh, what you do is you generate multiple perturbations of this given input by turning on or off um, the features, right? So. Um, if you do zero here, it means uh, you're kind of removing Christmas from your input. So in the first case, you're gonna have a sentence like for song visit my, sorry, so for song visit and smile. That's it. And then you have the function prediction 0.17 and uh, the weight here means how close you are from the, um, to the original input. So if you have a lot of zeros here, then you're gonna be far away. And uh, based on this, you can fit a linear function on top of the features here, um, closely mimicking the probabilities here. 
and the result is like this. Um, so for all these features, you're gonna have a feature weight, and it's gonna be a sparse linear again, so you're gonna have a lot of zeros, and only for a few uh, words, you're gonna have um, positive weights. And in this case, channel has a huge positive weight, indicating when you mention channel, it's, it's very likely to be a spam. Okay, so that's it for line example. I, I'm gonna talk about Shapley values next time. And uh, here's your feedback slide. See you next time.